Hi, this is Sijil Jacob, and uh, today I'm going to talk about clinical management of pulpal calcifications. For any clinician, the first step in endodontic therapy is uh, usually the endodontic axis. And uh, when we uh, perform an endodontic axis, most of us would prefer cases like these, where uh, the canals are wide open and you don't really have to go around looking for the canal. But as specialists, these are the cases that will often get referred to you. Cases like these where the canals are obliterated and the previous clinician has often made an attempt to find the canal, couldn't find the canal and then the case gets referred to you. So I started my practice in 2001 and for the first uh, four years of my practice um, I practiced without a microscope and when I was referred these sort of cases um, it was always a bit of guesswork. I never really had any fixed protocol. But once the microscope came into the practice um, in about 2004-2005, uh, things started changing. I realized that uh, when we had the microscope as a tool, handling these sort of cases became much more predictable. But uh, when I looked around for resources you know, uh, in textbooks or articles whether to see if somebody has had, had written an article on how to handle these sort of calcified cases uh, when looking through the microscope, I couldn't really find any articles. So um, this uh, short lecture is my attempt to organize some of the clinical findings that I've discovered over the last 10 years of microscope usage um, uh, and uh, try and document it in a sequential manner so that it can be, can be useful for someone uh, who is using the microscope for the first time. Because when you start using the microscope uh, for the first time, um, the amount of data that you see uh, can be uh, quite overwhelming. So it helps to have some sort of protocol. So this is uh, my effort in the next 45 minutes or so. So when we divide uh, pulpal calcifications, I'd like to divide them for clinical purposes into pulp stones and calcific metamorphosis. Pulp stones are quite common in clinical practice, um, but we are mostly concerned about calcific metamorphosis. Pulp stones can be divided into removable and attached. Denticles are a separate uh, histological uh, entity, but they're not that significant clinically, so I'm not going to be too bothered about that. We're going to focus on pulp stones and mostly focused about calcific metamorphosis. Let's have a look at pulp stones. They can be removable or attached. Removable, as the name suggests, um, is easily detachable. They're not adherent to the adjacent uh, dentin walls, so you see them as hard uh, calcific masses, but they can be easily removed with a sharp spoon excavator or um, ultrasonics and they just come out in, 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 a, in a big piece and once the chunk of calcified uh, pulp stone is removed the underlying canals can be easily accessed. Attached pulp stones are a little more difficult because as the name suggests they are attached to the adjacent dentinal wall they're not easily dislodged so you need to have some sort of uh, magnification preferably a microscope so you can clearly differentiate um, what is a calcification um, and then you can precisely trough out, drill out the calcified part of the, uh, of the pulp uh, and not remove excess dentin. So uh, we'll, we'll briefly discuss this in some of the cases that you're going to see later on. So that's attached pulp stone, a little more difficult than uh, the, the removable pulp stone. Calcific metamorphosis is completely different. Most of our lecture uh, will be focused on how to handle calcific metamorphosis cases. What is calcific metamorphosis? It basically, the entire pulp uh, gets converted into hard calcified tissue and the canal completely gets obliterated with this hard tissue. So you can see here there is no trace of any canal or in this case you, can, you can't see any canal in this tooth whereas on the adjacent tooth you can clearly see the canal. So this is a calcific metamorphosis. And these are the most difficult cases to handle clinically. These are all examples of calcific metamorphosis. So before we uh, determine uh, the clinical techniques, you have to first evaluate whether or not you need to treat these cases because not all calcified cases need to be treated. Here's an example. This case was referred to me uh, for uh, treatment of this central incisor. Patient's complaint was uh, discoloration. She was not happy with the color. And uh, the clinician did a vitality test, found that the tooth was negative to pulp test and then um, referred the case to me for root canals. But yes, um, you can argue that it's non-vital, but um, look at the periodontal ligament. 
is completely intact, patient is asymptomatic, so why bother to do a root canal on this tooth? Because the patient's complaint is just the aesthetic part that can be easily managed with a veneer. So in this case, I would not uh, even attempt uh, to do a root canal uh, therapy on this tooth. Whereas this case, you can see the complete, completely obliterated, there's already a, a crown on this tooth, uh, but there is a lesion and clinically there is a sinus tract as well. So this tooth has to be treated. So two, two different teeth, but one uh, need not be treated and the other one has to be treated. So that's the first decision you have to make. Figure out whether or not you need to treat it in the first place. Once you've decided that you need to be, uh, that it needs to be treated, uh, you need certain armamentarium in your clinic uh, if you want to handle calcified uh, canals. Let's have a look at some of these armamentarium or tools that you need to have. First and most important is the microscope. Now, um, most of the things that you're going to hear now, uh, you cannot practice if in your clinical practice if you're not using the microscope. And um, some of you who know me probably realize that I am an evangelist when it comes to microscope uh, usage. Um, I believe very strongly that root canals should not be done without a microscope. And um, uh, I've been using it from 2005 onwards. So it's been a really long time and it, it's made a whole lot of difference in my clinical practice. Uh, because of this, I have uh, started a, a training center in Bangalore uh, two years ago. It's called the Microscope Training Center. This is uh, dedicated to just microscopic endodontic training. So the reason for starting this center is that I realized that most people uh, don't uh, use the microscope because they're not guided properly. Uh, and it's not that difficult to actually um, use the microscope in your clinical practice, provided you get the right guidance. And it is this guidance that we provide at the Microscope Training Center in Bangalore. So do have a look at our website if you'd like to know more. The second tool apart from the microscope is a micro aspirator and strop core because when you're handling calcified canals you are working in very deep areas and sometimes the three-way syringe cannot deliver air uh, into deep areas and that's where the micro aspirator and the strop core come into play. The third tool that you need to have is something called Munz burrs. Munz burrs are micro motor burrs which have two distinguishing uh, characteristics. One is it has a very long shank and two is they come in very small sizes. So you can do precise truffing of small areas. This is a Munz burr in action and you can see because of the long shank you get adequate clearance and you can clearly see where the tip is working. In addition, the tip is really small so um, you can drill out very small areas. Ultrasonics are also good tools to have in your armamentarium. Um, I would not use ultrasonics for cases where there's lots of a lengthy work required. I use them only in short bursts. Uh, for example, um, where the access is very limited, it comes in really handy. You can compare the access of a regular burr and a micromotor compared with the ultrasonic tip. You can see because of the angulations of the ultrasonic tip, um, they are readily, uh, the, the tip is easily visible. So they're very useful in areas where you have limited mouth opening. But I would not recommend using ultrasonics when the goal is to trough deep. You know, if you're if you're going to look for the canal, uh, reach the canal which is here, and you have to trough from here to here, then ultrasonics are not uh, the right tool. They're very slow, and they wear out pretty fast, and they are expensive. So Munz burrs are definitely better tools compared to ultrasonics, but ultrasonics can be helpful adjuvants in certain cases. Micro openers are also good uh, tools to have. These are nothing but endodontic files in a handle. And because they are in a handle, they uh, have better uh, visibility. So here you see a K file in a hand. The hand kind of obstructs where you're working. Because the hand is no longer there, uh, in, when you use a micro opener, you can clearly see where you're working. And that's the advantage of using a micro opener. So those are some of the tools that you need to have in your armamentarium. Now let's look some of the, at some of the clinical techniques. Uh, before we divide the clinical techniques into anterior and posterior teeth, I'd like to briefly mention uh, uh, some of the solutions that we use. Uh, when you're looking for calcified canals, you need to constantly clean out the debris. And uh, one of the techniques I like to suggest is uh, using a micro brush. And I use EDTA along with a micro brush and followed by sodium hypochlorite. So this is normally the sequence I use. I irrigate and scrub with EDTA or sodium hypochlorite. Then I wash it dry. Uh, then I observe color changes. And once I observe the color changes, I don't know what to do. Then I will start cutting with the burr. 
And once the, I cut with the burr and I'm no, and the debris kind of obscures the landmarks that I'm looking at, I would again irrigate and scrub dry and then observe again and then cut again. And I would just keep following the sequence again and again and again. So it is a, a you need a lot of patience to actually do this. Here's an example. When you see the tooth, you can see how it's completely uh, obscured with debris. I put some EDTA, scrub it with the micro brush, wash it, dry it, and then observe. I can clearly see the dark area and the lighter area. So I know that the canal is underneath the darker area here. Here's another example of a posterior tooth. This is a molar. You can see a clinician who went around and looking for the canal earlier. This, is in, this cavity is full of debris, so I fill this up with EDTA, use a micro brush, scrub out the debris, wash it out, dry it out, and then when I magnify it, I can clearly see the, sorry, I think I went ahead there. I can uh, clearly see the darker areas and the lighter areas. We'll, we'll discuss this case a little later. So when you look at the single, uh, when, when you look at the clinical techniques which you can use for uh, discovering calcified canals, we can divide these techniques into those techniques which are used for single rib teeth and those techniques which are used for multi-rooted teeth. Um, and these are some of the techniques that uh, you can use. Let's look at each of these techniques in detail. We're going to start with single rooted teeth or single canal teeth rather. You can use radiographs for single to single rooted teeth, and this technique is quite um, established in in the literature. Uh, it's very very straightforward. All you have to do is put a burr, and then at every millimeter you check take a radiograph, and you see the orientation of the burr in relation to the long axis of the tooth. If at any given instance you feel that the burr is going off the long axis, you can see this is the long axis, and the burr is deviated this side. Then you make a ne necessary correction which means you move the burr till you come back along the long axis. You keep doing this every few millimeters till you eventually locate the canal. So in this case, we located the canal and uh, you know once you locate the canal, you can treat it the usual way. And here you can see that quite a bit of destruction, coronal. I didn't expect this tooth to last, but uh, this is a seven year recall of the same tooth and it did last for seven years. The second uh, technique that you can use in single rooted tooth is color changes. Now, when you are dealing with uh, a single rooted teeth, um, you often find that it, there are different color variations. Um, most often, the dentine it will be white in color and the calcified portion of the pulp will usually be darker in color, brownish grayish in color. So in this image, you can see the clinician has made an access, couldn't find the canal. And when you look closely, you see two different layers, okay? This part is completely white. Here again, you see a whitish area, whereas in the middle is this dark area. This is the part that used to be the pulp once upon a time, and it's now calcified. So when we look for the canal, we focus on this dark area. We do not drill here, nor do we drill here, because that will result in a perforation. We stick to just the central dark area. We use a Munz burr. You can see how the Munz burr is able to specifically drill where we want to drill. And then that's exactly where we found the canal. And once you found the canal, the rest of the case is fairly straightforward. This is another example of a single uh, rooted uh, premolar. Somebody made an initial access, couldn't find the canal, and then referred the case to me. And the first thing we do is we uh, modify the axis. We uh, extend the axis to more uh, towards the central part. And then uh, once that is done, uh, we can differentiate three different areas. Right, so we have a whitish area on the sides and the central dark area. Now, this central dark area is what used to be the pulp once upon a time, and now it's calcified. So, we're going to focus drilling down only in this dark area. Once we drill down the dark area along that area, we find that a part of the dark area turns white. So, we see this part turns white, and even this part turns white. The only part which remains dark is this area here. So once we know that this is the area that remains dark, we don't drill here, we don't drill here. We just drill along this dark area here. You can also see a white spot in the middle. So we stick to that area and the dark area with the white spot remains consistent. So we just focus on that area alone. And when you keep doing that, at one point you will uh, uh, locate the canal. You can see that's the canal there. So that's the advantage of using the microscope. You can very clearly differentiate the darker areas compared to the monochromatic denting. 
And of course, once you find the canal, the rest of the case is fairly straightforward. We clean, shape, and then obturate the case. This is uh, another case uh, which has been crown prepped. So naturally, when, once the tooth is crown prepped, uh, people tend to lose orientation. So the clinician has made an axis which seems to be in the middle of the tooth because you can see this is crown prepped and the axis is fairly in the middle of the tooth. But because we have the microscope, you look closer and what do we see? We see a very bright area here where the clinician has made the axis and a darker area here. So we do not look for the canal here because we know that that's going to be for a perforation head for a perforation so we stick to the darker area here and uh, we drill down the dark area and sure enough that's where we found the canal and that's the canal there. so you can see the canal is skewed to one side and not exactly in the center that's because this tooth is uh, being crown prepped already and that's the post op of the case this is the pre op and this is a post op the, the other technique that you can use is something called law of centricity. Uh, we know that in single rooted teeth, um, the, uh, the, canal, uh, the single canal will usually be in the middle of the tooth in, along the long axis. So if you see a case where a clinician is deviated from the long axis of the tooth, then you can look for the canal along the long axis. This is a case where uh, somebody already made an axis and this is a completely different problem altogether. So um, when you see a, a large axis skewed onto one side, you need to doubt a perforation as well, which is what we did. We opened up the tooth, removed the temporary, and then we found a perforation. When you find a perforation skewed onto one side, you know that the canal is probably in the middle of the tooth, which is what we did. We looked for the canal in the middle of the tooth. You can see a typical classified dark area. And then once you've probed around the dark area, we found the canal. Once you found that canal, I sealed the perforation with MTA and then obturated the canal the usual way. So this is a pre-op, this is how we found the canal in the middle of the tooth and then this is the post-op. As far as this was concerned, we did a single uh, visit uh, obturation along with surgery. We, I obturated this entire canal with uh, MTA, orthograde MTA, filled the whole canal with MTA, put a post and build it up. And in the same session, I raised a flap and uh, curated out the epical lesion as well. So this is the pre-op and this is a two-year recall of the same case. You can see the lesions healed up quite well. And the perforated case also is, seems to be doing well. The other technique you can look for is uh, looking lingually for maxillary incisors. We know that um, one of the uh, the reasons why people tend to go labially is because the, of the way the, the incisor is positioned in the arch. If you look at this old diagram from Ingle, you can see when people make an axis, the tendency is to go labially. They don't, they hardly ever go palatally. So most of the time when clinicians make an axis, they are already far too labially. So it's a good idea to look lingually uh, in these cases. So here you can see the clinician has made the axis. It looks like it's in the center of the tooth. But what you need to do is look palatal uh, to the existing axis. So once you look palatal, you see the typical dark area. And once you drill down that dark area, you typically find the canal there. And of course, once you find the canal, you clean shape and obturate it the usual way. This is a just an image to show you where the actual canal was and where the clinician was looking for the canal. So this is a very common mistake. Whenever you get a maxillary incisor with a calcified canal and somebody has already made an axis, couldn't find the canal, then always look for the canal palatal to where the initial axis is made. So that's one technique that you can use. This is just to illustrate some cases which show uh, uh, what we've described earlier. This is a central incisor. Somebody had made an axis, couldn't find the canal. That's the reason. The reason is that the canal is somewhere here, but this part seems to be obliterated. So what we do is uh, we uh, go in there, and you can see the axis looks spot on. It looks bang in the middle, but the clinician couldn't find the canal. So what do we do? We look palatally. Now, when we look palatally, what do we see? We see a typical dark area, and when you zoom in, we actually see the calcified part of the canal. So this is what used to be the canal. So we drill down the middle of this tooth. And uh, sure enough, that's where we find the canal. So that's the canal and you can see how the pulp chamber is calcified here. Completely, the coronal part of the pulp. 
Now once you locate the canal, uh, you can see where it is far palately compared to where the clinician was looking for it earlier. And uh, once we located the canal, because this has a large lesion, uh, we, we did multiple runs of calcium hydroxide in this case. And I obturated this case after six months of calcium hydroxide and seeing some amount of bone fill. So this is the post-op and uh, I recall this case after two years and it seems to be doing pretty well. This is how we started and this is how uh, we ended two years later. So these are some of the techniques that you can use and uh, there are occasionally some cases which don't follow this pattern. So, okay, so most of the time you follow what we have described and you will be on track. But there are the odd cases which don't follow these rules and when you are confused it's a good uh, technique to come back to what I call the macroscopic perspective and also employ what is known as the fisheye view, which means um, you see around corners. So let me try and uh, tell you what uh, this means. Uh, here's a case where uh, we made the initial access, cannot find the canal, so we look into the uh, tooth and this seems like a very straightforward case, you know, because it's sh it's, it just shows what we've described earlier. There seems to be a whitish area more labially and a darkish area more palately. So all we had to do uh, is to drill down the palatal aspect, which is what we do in most cases. But when I started drilling down, I found that uh, something just didn't feel right here. Because one of the reasons why it didn't feel right was, look at the amount of labial tooth structure still available and look at the amount of palatal tooth structure available. The palatal structure, tooth structure is very weak here. So something told me that um, maybe the canal is not palatal. I need to be a little more cautious here. So what I do in these sort of cases when I'm in doubt is I fill this entire canal with uh, water and what the water does is it gives you a macroscopic perspective. So the water fills this canal and what I see uh, through the water is I see a dark patch here, I see a white patch in the middle, but I also see a dark patch here. And I also realize that there's a large amount of labial tooth structure still left and there's very little palatal tooth structure still left. So that gives me uh, an idea that maybe I need to explore this dark line that I see here instead of here. So once I dry the tooth and then have a closer look at that black line, I see remnants of what used to be the chamber bang in the middle. So we drill around that dark line and sure enough, that's where the canal was. So that's where the canal was. So this is uh, where the microscopic perspective really helps. And once you clean and clean it and shape it, um, you can see how the calcified portion of the canal leads into the actual canal opening. And once we've done with that, you can clean shape and then obturate the tooth uh, the usual way. Here's another case where uh, somebody made the access, couldn't find the canal, referred it, and um, you can see the canal remnants somewhere here. So the trick is to reach from here to here without um, a perforation. Um, that is the, the tricky part. So this is what we did. We look at color changes. In this case, we looked at a combination of both color changes as well as uh, intermittent radiographs. So you can see here, this looks like a dark patch. So we're on track. So we drill down the dark area. And after a while, when we go deeper, we, we take radiographs with the Munz burr in place. Now in this radiograph, we can see that the burr is actually going far too distally. So we need to reorient mesially. And once we do that, uh, we can see the canal uh, being discovered. So we here we rely on uh, the radiographs as well as color changes. And we realize that the actual location of the canal is actually uh, a bit more mesial than uh, what it used to be. It's not in the center of the tooth. It's skewed towards one side. And that's because of the angulation of the tooth. So this is another tooth which is a slightly different from the norm. So this is a post-op of the same case. This is how we started and this is how we ended. So as I described, cases like these, I've seen a lot of people use ultrasonics to reach from here to here. Now, these are very poor cases for ultrasonics. You need to use a Munzpur. You should not use an ultrasonics for this, this sort of case. It's painfully slow if you use an ultrasonic. Here's another case where uh, somebody did an access, couldn't find the canal, and, but the canal is very much there and then referred the case to me. This patient also had a sinus tract. So when I took out the temporary filling, this is what I see. So this clinician probably knows the fact that he has to look palately, so he went far too palately and then perforated. Fortunately, the perforation is supracrestal, so there wasn't much of a problem repairing this. 
uh, I repaired this with uh, GIC and what you what you can see is clearly see under the microscope is the calcified part of the canal you know this used to be the pulp once upon a time and now it's completely blocked out so we need to look for the canal here not here and the clinician previous clinician was not able to look for it because he or she didn't have the microscope so you can't appreciate these color changes without the microscope so once you know that this is the canal we focus our attention to just this area and sure enough that's where we found a tiny opening and uh, once we found the opening we were able to reach the apex we clean shaped put calcium hydroxide and then recall the patient 10 days later the sinus tract had disappeared and then uh, we clean shaped and then obturated the tooth and this is a pre-op this is how we ended and uh, this is a one-year recall and the patient seems to be doing pretty fine There are some additional tools we can use for canal location and one of the tools is uh, cone beam CT. In fact, I use cone beam CT a lot during calcified cases these days um, and it's really, really handy to, first of all, to know where the canal is and most important to know the location of the canal in a palatolabial direction or a buccolingual direction. So here's an example. This case was misdiagnosed. You know, this was actually a nasopalatine cyst, but uh, some clinician went in, broke an instrument in one of the teeth, and then went around looking for the canal. Couldn't find the canal in one of this uh, in the teeth. So this case was referred to me, and this patient already had a CBCT because of the lesion. And on the CBCT, what it does is the it gives you a, a, a palatolabial view, and uh, you can see the clinician going far too labially, almost perforating, and the canal is palatal to where the previous access has been made so uh, I can correlate what I see on the CBCT with the clinical picture so what the CBCT tells me is the canal will be found at the palatal aspects of the previously made as made access cavity so when I open this case I know that the canal is not going to be here it's going to be somewhere here so I can focus my attention here and then sure enough that's where the canal is found once the canal is found, I uh, clean shape and uh, obturate the usual way. This is another case where uh, uh, somebody went around looking. You can see trace of a canal here, but you can't see much of the canal here. So what I did is, um, again, I, I, I went in there, focused on the dark area, but as I went deeper, I wasn't really sure uh, where to drill. So what I did is I put a blob of gutta perca where I was drilling uh, in the apical part sorry in the coronal part the and I, I i closed this with a temporary filling and then took an interappointment cbct and what the interappointment cbct told me was uh, the canal was labial to where i was drilling earlier so you can see the blob of gutta here and you can see where the canal is so when i do that when i know that with that information i know that the canal is going to be labial uh, to where i was drilling uh, or looking for the canal and sure enough that's where I found the canal and uh, once I found the canal I cleaned shape and put a post as well this is the post stop of the same tooth so those are some of the techniques that you can use for anterior teeth um, let's look at some of the techniques that you can use for posterior teeth when we say posterior I mean multi-rooted or multi-canal teeth in multi-canal teeth, uh, one relies on radiographs. You can um, recognize color variations even in multi-rooted teeth. And you can also look at tracing white lines. And then finally looking for what we call white spots. Let's took look, take a look at each of this, uh, these in detail. Radiographs, as you all know, helps you determine uh, whether or not the tooth is calcified. So you can anticipate this before starting the case. For example, if you look at this radiograph, you know that here the pulp is clearly visible. Here the pulp is clearly, root canal is clearly visible. Whereas in this, it's completely obliterated. So when you do an access, you will not feel the typical drop that you're going to feel in this tooth uh, when you drill this tooth. So you can be mentally prepared uh, to encounter a bit of calcification. Similarly in this tooth as well. But mostly uh, we rely on color variations. So in multi-rooted teeth, uh, you find that there's a clear distinction. You can clearly distinguish between the palpal floor and the monochromatic dentin. The adjacent dentin will be white in color, whereas the palpal floor will be grayish, brownish grayish in color. So you can see this is the palpal floor. And if you are looking for canal, 
you are never going to find the canal under this white area. You usually find it at the junction of this brown area along the where the, the brownish area meets the whitish area. That's where you usually find the canal. So we're not going to look for the canals here, here or here. You are going to look it along, at, along the borders here. And sure enough, this is where we found it. You can see MB1, MB2 and MB3. And all of these are where the darkish grayish uh, part of the pulpit floor meets the adjacent monochromatic dentine. Here's a clinical case where somebody did multiple rounds of calcium hydroxide dressing on this tooth and patient continued to have tenderness, uh, referred the case to me and immediately when you open it you can appreciate the color changes. You can see the darker, mono, darker pulpal floor, you can see the whitish monochromatic dentine and we also see an attached pulp stones. So the first thing we do is dislodge this, drill out this attached pulp stone and the minute we dislodge this attached pulp stone you can clearly see the missed MB2 very large MB2 and uh, that's the reason the patient continued to have discomfort. So once we unearthed the MB2, we, uh, in this case there was also a DB2 so we, we cleaned shaped five canals and then obturated the case as well. Here's another case where some uh, the clinician did an access, went around looking for the canal, couldn't find the canal. You can see where the clinician was looking for the canal and the reason for this is the attached pulp stone. You can clearly see the, the pulp stone attached and the attached pulp stone is preventing access to the canals. So when you look the, uh, closely under the microscope you can clearly differentiate the attached pulp stone which has a kind of a glassy appearance compared to the underlying uh, pulpal floor or the dentine. So we selectively remove this entire pulpal uh, calcified uh, attached pulp stone and once you do that you can see uh, where the actual canals are and this is where the clinician was looking for the canal. So um, this is, this is a, a great example of how the microscope predictably uh, helps in treating these sort of cases. And once we located the canals, again, the rest of the procedure was fairly straightforward. We cleaned, shaped, obturated the tooth, and you can see where the canal was and where the clinician was actually looking for the canal in the first place. This is the post-op of the same case. This is another case where um, uh, you can see the entire uh, calcification all the way right up to here. What you see here as black is not the pulp chamber, that's actually a cervical erosion. So we first um, patch that area up and then make the axis from coronal uh, direction. When you do an axis, you can see the calcified portion of the chamber. But because we have the microscope, we can be very consistent. You can see clearly differentiate the calcified portion of the pulp compared to the adjacent monochromatic dentine. So we can stay on target till we actually find the canals. And once you find the canals, we obturate. And you can see how conservative you can be uh, because you have the microscope and because of the fact that you're able to stay on track, um, you can achieve uh, your desired goals without sacrificing too much coronal tooth structure. Second technique you can use is uh, tracing white lines. Um, in posterior teeth, uh, there are white lines which connect canals sometimes. Uh, this is an example where you have a premolar, uh, maxillary first premolar, uh, and we remove the bridge and uh, look underneath, we see completely obliterated uh, uh, pulp chamber. So we really don't know where to look for the canal. And when you're confused, what we do is we know that this is a maxillary premolar, and we know that there usually are two canals and these two canals or one palatal and one buccal are usually connected with a, a white line. So we, what we do is we take a munz burr and then slowly move in a bucco palatal direction and we keep doing that, keep doing that till a white line appears. Okay. And once you know that there's a white line, we can trace the end of these white lines to actually look for the canal which is what we did and that's where we found the canal. So you can see the canals along the white line and uh, once you found the canal, the rest of the procedure is fairly straightforward. Another technique is something called white spots. In certain posterior teeth where the canals are calcified, uh, the canals often show up as white spots. Here are some examples which, which illustrate white spots. This is a case where uh, somebody uh, already did endodontic therapy for this case and uh, the patient had continuous discomfort and you can see 
how the clinician has already gone looking for the mesial canals, couldn't find it because the mesial canals are obliterated and then uh, referred the case. So you can see uh, there's a lot of debris here. So we uh, again do what I described in, uh, in the beginning of my presentation. I put a drop of um, EDTA, scrub this area with a micro brush so I can see uh, this more clearly. You know, I put EDTA there and then after cleaning up with the EDTA, this is how it looks. So it's a bit more clear now. You can see the dark area and then when you zoom in, what do we see? We see a dark area and then towards this side, we see the two white spots, which used to be the canal once upon a time and now it's calcified. Okay, so that's the one canal there and this is the other canal. So once you see these white spots, then you can use a Munz bird to precisely drill down these white spots and uh, those generally open into the canal. So in this case, we opened up the mesial canals and then we also retreated the distal canals as well. So um, this is the post-op of the same case. This is how we started and this is how we ended. Of course, they, this patient has some perio issues as well, which is a different problem altogether. This is a, an amelogenesis imperfect tuck case which also shows you white sp spots. The entire chamber gets completely uh, obliterated in this case. When you open it, you really have, have no clue what to do. So when you have no clue, we do the same thing. We go uniformly along the triangle, so uh, just to look for some clues. And uh, I use this uh, tip, ultrasonic tip in this case because burrs again are a bit aggressive here. Uh, so you want to be a bit conservative. So um, we use an ultrasonic tip which cuts at the apical part here. Um, this is a Startex number 5 kit. So you can use anything which cuts uh, at the apical part. And we keep going along this triangle looking for some signs of the canal. And usually these canals in this, these sort of cases will appear as white spots. Um, you can see a white spot appearing here. And over here and over here. This is a close-up of how the white spot looks like and once you see this white spot you switch from ultrasonics you use a Munz burr and you just drill down the white spot alone with a Munz burr. Here you can see the Munz burr in action because of my clearance I can clearly see the tip of the burr and because I'm using a very small size I can specifically drill down only the white spot with the Munz burr and that's what I did and you can see how the canal opens up under the white spot. So we do the same with the other canals as well. So this is a good example of drilling down white spots. Uh, the other technique that you can use when you are confused is something called fisheye view. What does a fisheye view mean? It's got nothing to do with fish, but it's just a, a, a see, uh, you know, that you see around corners uh, by filling the whole chamber with water. Let me try and explain this uh, by showing you a case. This is a case where somebody did an access, went around looking everywhere for the canal, couldn't find even one canal and then sent the case to me. So when I got this case, this is how it looked when I took off the temporary filling. It was one big hole, no trace of any familiar landmarks. I can see a perforation here and a near perforation there, but I have no idea where the canals are. So when I'm lost, what I do is I fill this entire canal with water, like I showed you in the, in the single rooted teeth. I fill this canal with water and what the water does is it gives me a fish eye view which means it helps me see around the corners okay so here what it does is it goes and helps me see around this wall so what it tells me is that there seems to be an opening somewhere there it also tells me that there's an opening here which means the palatal is probably underneath here and I can also see something there right so what it tells me that the canals are not where the clinician has already made the access, it's actually underneath these existing walls. And once I have that information, I can dry this uh, chamber and then have a closer look at these plots. You can see this is where the, the when you fill with water, it showed that there was a canal there. So I can focus on this wall and then sure enough, that's where the canals were. It was underneath the wall. And once I located the canal, we found the uh, mesiobuccal, distobuccal, MB2 and the palatal. And I sealed the uh, perforation with MTA and then um, I obturated the case. 
So in summary, these are the different techniques that we discovered and you need to use your common sense and um, your experience uh, to have a combination of any of these techniques to achieve a predictable result. Very often it's a combination of multiple techniques, not just a single technique, uh, but you will get a hang of it when you do a lot of cases under the microscope. If you'd like to keep in touch with me, I am available on Facebook. Uh, you can look for Dr. Siju Jacob Endodontist on Facebook and uh, send me a message if you have any doubts uh, regarding uh, what we've discussed. You can also reach me um, on our Facebook page for the Microscope Training Center. Um, I'm available on both these pages if you need to reach me. Uh, for those of you who prefer a website, uh, this is the website that we have for the training center that I mentioned. Uh, especially for postgraduates, uh, we keep having a lot of uh, highly subsidized even free courses every year for postgraduate students so if you're a, a postgraduate student just um, uh, drop me a note uh, and we'll keep you posted uh, whenever we have courses coming up so the best way to reach me otherwise is through my individual website this is uh, sijujacob.com and uh, if you'd like to drop me a message just click on the contact here and then uh, um, you can just fill in the column there and click on submit and um, I will receive uh, whatever message um, that you'd like to send. So that's it from me um, and uh, I hope uh, to keep in touch with uh, all of you who are listening to this program. I'll be happy to ans answer any queries uh, that you may have um, regarding this. Uh, goodbye and take care.